you know, one of the things that I, I had, I had, I've thought about is that there was this, um, there was this, there has been this really strong movement towards uh, becoming more conscious of these disparities and privilege and the way that, uh, that um, power is wielded in really, really painful ways. And some people were calling that like being more woke. And now it feels like there's this whole backlash, right? Where it's like all of a sudden people look at uh, certain presidential candidates who don't, who don't apologize for anything and who don't seem to give a shit about anything. And they're like, oh, I'm- Which one? <laughs> Trump. <laughs> Trump mainly. Trump mainly, just to name them, thank you. <laughs> but, but others and other business leaders, it's not, doesn't just exist in him. And so I'm, see, I'm curious how you see that because it's almost now, almost like there, there's a, there is like a proudness in not caring how your actions affect others. And I'm wondering how that's landing for you, how you, how you like decipher what that is all about. Listen, my next book is called Revolutionary Grace. Revolutionary Grace. Revolutionary Grace. I shouldn't be talking about it. Don't nobody tell my my my. my <laughs> I'm not finished writing it, but but the it's landing really terribly for me. I don't understand. It's a naivety probably that I, that I struggle yeah. with because I probably should. I do understand uh -huh. intellectually. I understand in right. my heart. I don't yeah. understand. Yeah. I understand evil. I understand meanness. I understand unkindness. But in, in my intellectually, I, so listen, I'm an organizer, mm -hmm. been an organizer most of my life. I understand strate strategically how there's always a backlash, right? Yeah. I understand that we spent almost a decade in a moment that was, in, in, a, in a large moment of movement, yeah. of forward movement, right? Yeah. We, we went from, you know, uh, if we were to market, let's say Trayvon Martin, mm -hmm. excuse me, the onset of Black Lives Matter, yeah. we had huge strides in yeah. racial justice, um, mm -hmm. climate change, training programs, and yeah, you know, we had we had really big visible strides yeah. in social justice. Yeah. That was, I'll say, I'll say, I'll mark that if I put brackets on it, about a decade, yeah. right? 2012, 2013, around around that time, and even a little for even a little, a little earlier, right? Because before the around around the time of social ju social just social media, yeah. kind of um, having a big influence um, as a organizing tool, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it allowed young people to become more involved yeah. and get more information quickly, mm -hmm. and it was a tool to really gather young people mm -hmm. quickly, gather people quickly. Um, and get information faster. Yeah. And it was fascinating to watch yeah. that happen. But that fell in the middle of an ongoing plan that, and if I'm using left, right as a, mm -hmm. as a the, the um, explanation in this moment, the right has had a steady ongoing plan, right? We saw it in the Tea Party, we saw it in Reaganomics. We, they give it different names every about 10 years, but it's the same plan. Mm -hmm. It's the same plan. We know that. Yeah. They just give it a different name. Yeah. They put a different face on it, but they have been moving forward in the same plan. Yeah. And so what's different now, I think, is that when they saw this big burst mm -hmm. happen, I think they realized they had to double down. That their power was being threatened. Their power was being threatened yeah. differently than this. Yeah than it has been yeah. in previous times, because yeah. they were sort of just moving forward mm -hmm. with their plan. And, and I think they realized they had to double down yeah. because information was moving quickly yeah. into, yeah. you know, on our side. Yeah. What we have seen now is a level of, uh, a, this deep evilness. Because yeah. before, I, I believed we had, mm -hmm you know, Republicans and Democrats and blue and red and this side and that side, and you could be a moderate this. This is something different. Mm -hmm. This is not just ideological, yeah. right? This is, this is something different. And so this book that I'm writing is about, because there's also something happening on our side, Yeah. right? Yeah. If you even take their side off and take their side and put, put it, you know, put them over here for a minute, there's something also happening on our side. Mm -hmm. We can't come together 
mm. even for the greater good. Like we just need to move forward. We need mm. to like figure out the things that we do agree on yeah. to move forward. We can't even do that. Yeah. So part of what, part of what revolutionary grace is about is I see a lot of people talk about liberation. Mm. Ultimately in the social justice movement, we are fighting for liberation. Yeah. That's what I've been saying for years. For 30-something yeah. years I've been talking about fighting for liberation. I no longer believe in a politic of liberation that doesn't have a politic of grace. Mm, wow. I, I just, I just, wow. I can't, this is like my, my litmus test. Yeah. I can't fight with you. I can't work with you. I can't, I cannot, I no longer believe that. Mm -hmm. And not just any kind of grace. Mm-hmm. Right, because regular grace to me is like, we can all find a way to find grace for each other. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Whether you're a Christian or, and, and most religions have some form of grace mm -hmm. embedded in them. Or if you're not religious, right? Even yeah. if you're not religious, yeah, you can yeah. find yeah. grace, right? Yeah. That's the beauty of grace. Yeah. Um, but revolutionary grace to me is when, uh, is there's a, there is a, um, there is a foundational principle that I have lived by since I was a teenager. When I learned to be an organizer, I learned this principle. Mm. It was the people who were teaching me the first principle of nonviolence, mm -hmm. nonviolent organizing is, I will not violate your dignity, mm. but I will not compromise mine. Wow. I have lived by that since wow. I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. And the second part of that because this is leadership training, yeah. is when I, when I make a decision, it will be to serve everybody, even my enemies. Wow. Those are the two principles I have lived by. Wow, those are big ones. 35 years. Those are big ones. Yeah. Don't steal this. It's going to be in my book. <laughs> <laughs> But this is the foundation of the book. This is what the book is about. Is is I will not violate your dignity, but I will not compromise mine. Yeah. It puts you at an impasse and it forces you to have to work from that place. And when I make a decision, it will be to serve everybody, even my yeah. enemies. That's what leadership is to me. And is that what grace is to you? It is. It's the, it's the foundation for grace to me. It, and it's the catalyst that activates all my other values. Because it seems like non-grace would be othering and separation, and we have to get rid of, destroy, put away something, and that grace would be, they somehow are still a part of us, but they can't be in the role that they were in. Am I yeah. getting close to but that? But I'm gonna tell you what makes it revolutionary. Please. Right? Because when you think about the people who are asked to give grace all the time. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the people who are asked to give grace all the time are the people who get it the least. Yeah. True. And that's what I'm un examining in this book. Yeah. yeah. It's true. When you think about black women, black people, yeah. women, people of color, you think about the people who have the least. Revolutionary grace is trying to figure out how do you give grace to the people who need it the most but get it the least. Yeah, beautiful. beautiful. That's when we really can get to liberation to me. I don't think we can get to liberation until we get not just a politic of grace but a politic of revolutionary grace. Yeah, that's beautiful.